Hey, hey, this is the Coffee and Technology Podcast brought to you by Cropster. Today we have the pleasure of speaking with Sue Yagmodi, a founder of Driftaway Coffee. Driftaway Coffee is Brooklyn-based and is a market leader in coffee subscriptions and virtual tastings. Suyog brings a true understanding of the importance of data collection and data protection in the coffee industry. Listen and learn as we dig deeper into the world of data and coffee subscriptions. And don't forget to follow and like this podcast on your preferred podcast platform. And be sure to follow us on social media at Cropster. Welcome, Suyog. Norbert, welcome back. Uh, it's Suyog, it's really cool to have you, man. How's it going? It's going great. How are you? Great to be here. Thank you, yeah. You're in uh, you're in Amsterdam right now, right? Yeah, I'm traveling for a few weeks. Um, my I have some family that lives here, so we're just like staying with them and working from here. Then taking a little bit of time off, catch some sun, like in southern Europe. Hopefully, it's been a, it's been a yeah. crazy year, and just like last year, like just different, but it's been a busy year. So everybody's taking some time off and trying to do the same before the end of the year starts. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Cool. No, um, so but you so normally you're not based in Europe. Obviously, you're based in Brooklyn, if I'm not mistaken, or New York. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. br- both me and also Drift Away, we're we're completely okay. based out of Brooklyn. We have a lot of remote workers. Even within Brooklyn, there's people that like work remotely, um, but the production and sort of everything that's physically needed for operations and production is in Brooklyn, New York. Nice. Mm-hmm. Um, no, that's cool. Maybe you could tell us a little bit more about Drift Away, um, what your motivation to start that was. Um, I know it's like it's a it's a pretty big subscription service now, so love to hear more about that. Yeah. Um, so Drift Away, Drift Away Coffee is um, direct to consumer coffee uh, roaster. Initially, um, we started in um, just selling subscriptions but we've sort of evolved a little bit and we can talk, I'll talk a little bit more later about like the more assortment of products that we've built uh, beyond subscriptions. Uh, Mm -hmm. But yeah, we started in 2014 in our uh, home kitchen, uh, roasting coffee on a Be More. Uh, Mm -hmm. If if, uh, I'm sure everybody's familiar, (laughs) people that listen to a a, you know, roasting software podcast will know, um, but it's it's like a microwave roaster that does a little cyl- fake cylindrical action. Um, <laughs> in my opinion, fake cylindrical action. Um, but I've roasted thousands of batches on a B more. In fact, there was a time when we had to scale up, and I we ended up getting a second B more because we were like, oh, we'll be twice as fast. Um, <laughs> um, and um, you know. Um, uh, that's just a little tidbit of how we started, but essentially the reason we started drift away was before, um, before the drift away, my partner and I, who are the two founders and we still work on drift away full time. We used to live in London. We had access to really quick, quickly delivered freshly roasted coffee, um, in the mail, like literally you'd order it by three o'clock and it would show up the next morning. UK is a really small country. It's possible to do that fairly easily. We got spoiled by that. Um, we got spoiled by specialty beans. We were improving our co- coffee consumption at home, um, both like switching to a grinder, switching to a better machine, switching to pour over setups. I read um, Michelle Wiseman's book, God in a Cup, around that time, and I kind of really, really got into it. Um, when we moved to New York, um, back in 2013, we um, we had access to a lot of good cafes nearby um, that had access, you know, to good beans. Uh, Stumptown Intelligentsia was sort of that was like their peak. Um, I would I would say that that was like when they were really flourishing and and mm-hmm. starting to spawn off some of the uh, what are now more smaller roasters. Um, and what we found is that we couldn't get access to the same speed and freshness and quality of beans that we had access to in London. So it was either, you know, cafes had less less fresh roasted coffee or um, grocery stores, obviously, even now it's very difficult to find fresh, fresh coffee. And then we tried a couple of subscription services. Um, many of them were good, um, but it was hard to get the type of coffee that you would like all the time. You always mm-hmm. had a roaster's choice situation going on. It was all sort of early days for subscriptions as well. 
Um, so around the same time, uh, my partner Anu, she wanted to start uh, working in like nonprofit or something that was like a little bit more of our own. Before that, we were working in a marketing tech company, marketing consulting company that became a creative agency and and uh, an ad agency eventually. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, when we uh, when these two things came together, we we're like, oh, we should just you know start doing something on the side and. So we uh, put together a little website uh, on Squarespace originally, I want to say, uh, nice. and then uh, added a recurring billing plugin at some point where you, you get like a private URL and you can pay for a subscription. And mm-hmm. we, you know, it, it was like November 2013. We we're like, oh, obviously people are going to come and buy. And uh, one of those like build it and they will show up. They will come feelings. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, that didn't happen. You know, reality <laughs> hits you very quickly on that front. Uh, we started an Etsy store, which we still operate, uh, which we really enjoy. And, and you know, it, Etsy's got some challenges, but it feels like a very organic and good place for people to purchase mm-hmm. certain types of things. It's not clearly not for coffee as much as it is for many other things, but we have sort of a nostalgic connection to it. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, essentially, we 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 started because we wanted to create something and we wanted to find coffee that was good and fresh and specialty for ourselves. Um, and now, about seven years, coming up on seven years this year, um, you know, Driftaway has grown quite a bit, uh, both in terms of the volume and impact, but also transformed a little bit in terms of the things that we care about and the mission that we are trying to go after and also the team and the and sort of the people that we are working with to make it even better as we go mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that was a long answer hopefully that's, that's no okay. that's fantastic that's exactly those type of stories we are looking for and uh, you know it's i can relate very much uh, to many of your things you said uh, building building uh, a company myself or with, with, with our team of course uh as you said, you know, you build something and you, then of course in your head it works, but the, the world out there doesn't immediately know about it <laughs> or respond yeah. to it. And I also find it quite very interesting that you use Etsy as, um, uh, as a coffee store. I've never thought about that. Uh, I always think of like hand, handcraft things on Etsy and I like it very much, but, um, um, kudos to you. This is cool <laughs> to, to have your own like coffee coffee store there <laughs> yeah it's not our only it's it's definitely not our main um mm-hmm. yeah like selling channel we mostly sell on our website uh but it's it it's uh it's it's sort of a place where you know if you organically get found then people will come to you directly as well right right so maybe i mean maybe also tell us a little bit about too i mean by the way I mean, amazing story i love to hear that um but I know you've mentioned too uh, to us that you you do a lot of virtual tastings. Um, to me, that's been really fascinating, especially during the pandemic where we can't meet in person and everything's gone virtual. Um, I really love to know how you know how that came about. Was that a pre-pandemic thing, or did that happen during the pandemic? And how you've been able to turn that idea to monetize it into a part of your business model? Yeah. Um, so. Um... I think education has been something that we've wanted to focus on and sort of done. Um, I, I'd say like we've put a, a decent amount of emphasis on um, every every time we want to see like how do we sort of get the you know sort of the customers are coming to a specialty coffee anyway. The question is how do you bring them bring them along and sort of expand that pool. Um, so. And education is is educating customers about like using a grinder, uh, you know, what is pea berry coffee, how do you roast mm. coffee, like those types of things has has always been a uh, goal and a commitment from our side. Um, I think, you know, in sort of the starting like a company journey, some some things work out really well right from the beginning and some things just don't. And they just you just keep it in your head and every time like some sort of forces come together in this case likely the pandemic not not the best force you want but it it did happen you know so the reality of that was that we've tried uh sort of coffee concierge concepts in the past um mm-hmm. and i think a lot of other people have as well uh, a lot of other roasters uh, to like 
connect with customers on education. Um, text message, video calls directly with, you know, subscribers, those types of things, never really stuck and sort of scaled in an appropriate way. Um, mm -hmm. And so bringing, bringing this around to virtual tastings and sort of virtual education in general, um, when the pandemic started, uh, first few months, we were just like, are we even going to stay open? Because everything kind of felt like it was, it's kind of like, what's the point? But once we were able to get past that, we actually saw increased demand because <clears throat> more of the coffee consumption was switching to home consumers. Um, and then <clears throat> we brought on uh, someone who we know in coffee from a very long time. In fact, um, J uh, James, James McCarthy, he actually educated us when we were getting into coffee ourselves. And we said that, nice. you know, it would be really cool if we can do coffee education through a virtual lens because uh, for holiday season last year, people were not going to be meeting friends and family as much mm -hmm. as they would normally do. And gifting is a big part of what we do at Drift Away Coffee Gifts. Um, so related to that, we uh, started working on a script for virtual tasting. We've always had in our product portfolio a Explorer kit, which is four different coffees different uh, from different parts of the world roasted differently. And that's just the first delivery in every subscription. So it just made sense that you would taste those coffees side by side in an assisted way virtually with our educator, James, leading you. So essentially, you know, we worked on it for a little bit. Uh, we sort of, you know, perfected the script and we, we borrowed a lot of concepts from cupping um, mm -hmm. minus the quality control components, like the negative stuff, because here mm -hmm. we're looking for like, like, differences rather than you know um, a score um yeah. and yeah that's basically how it started uh, so it definitely a pandemic era um pandemic era evolution but i'd say you know it's something that it's been in our mind as a principle and as a goal um but it just kind of came together more quickly because of the pandemic last year i think we launched it um october 2020 so it's mm -hmm. not even been a year we've done something like 300, 400 tastings uh, mm -hmm. across three, 4,000 people. Um, many of them wow. are home consumers, uh, but increasingly it is more work from home groups of corporate customers. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's been really, honestly, that was a little surprising for us because we just thought that it was going to be like, you know, person plus like a couple of family members in different parts of the same city even, or sometimes like nearby, but uh, we just thought it would be like very intimate, small groups, three, four people, 10 people tops. We had a cap on it in the beginning that no more mm -hmm. than nine allowed. And now, you know, over time we realized that it's actually not a big deal. Like uh, people just know how to use Zoom. They just know how to use all the technology platforms more easily. So uh, we've done even like 300 person tastings. Oh, wow, that's amazing. So, so can you explain this just quickly? What, so how does it work? So people come together on Zoom and then they all have the coffees in front of them. Um, what's, yeah. The, yeah, so, what's the experience? Yeah, we, um, we use a, um, essentially um, a virtual sort of booking uh, software mm -hmm. that's connected to our website. So you can essentially book a time and a, a date and time, which is connected to the calendar of our educators. And mm -hmm. um, when they, uh, when someone signs up, you just, um, you also put in all your shipping information. Um, mm -hmm. Everything is at the very minimum two weeks out so that it gives us enough time to ship coffees, um, mm -hmm. freshly roasted coffees shipped. Um, and then um, and then once you book it, you, you basically get a, a calendar invite a pre-event email um, you can also gift it as a um, if you don't know when you want to schedule it mm -hmm. you can gift it as a concept and then right. someone can contact us and like schedule it later um, mm -hmm. and so that's and but that's the first offering we started with was just the side-by-side -side tasting mm -hmm. uh, and then after that we've added brewing classes uh, you know a couple other sort of 
pour over classes and a few other options as well, which people individually sign up for. So the participants get uh, get uh, a whole bean coffee, um, and then they have to have infrastructure at home to grind and to brew. Yeah, yeah. So we started with whole beans only, um, but then we added an option to do ground coffee mm -hmm. once we were able to figure out a vacuum seal the tasting packs. Mm -hmm. um, so we do have an option for both now. Uh, I'm honestly, like it's it's a little bit of a uh, struggle in terms of our internal decision because we're like, we don't want to send ground coffee. It's not going to taste the same. We did a bunch of tastings and testing mm -hmm. uh, internally. And we're like, you know, obviously it doesn't taste as good as whole beans, but relative to not being able to taste them or, or um, you know, or, or sort of answering a different question, can you still perceive the differences between the coffees? Mm -hmm. And at what point does the quality drop off? So we just right. kind of like played with a few different variables, try to like be very aggressive on the um, shipping time so that people get the coffee right away. It's also mm -hmm. vacuum sealed so that when you open it, it's instantly into the cupping glass or the tasting glass and then you're immediately drinking it. So there's a little bit of degradation, but we do include go ground coffee as well. Mm -hmm. Awesome. It's awesome. Um, and one thing that makes me think of is a lot of this comes down to the idea of creating a personalized experience and personalization. So I'm wondering from you and your partner's background in marketing, um, you're essentially selling a subscription service. So what what are some of the differences or levels of importances when you're set when when person when the idea of personalization comes into place when you're trying to get people to do some virtual tastings with you or selling or even getting them to sign up for your subscription? Um, you know how important is is that versus just selling normal retail bags? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know when we when we were first starting out. Um, one of the things that we did was we picked up the Lean Startup book and tried to like, we wanted to do the whole thing from beginning to end, sourcing coffee, green coffee, roasting, uh, designing all the e-commerce components, customer support, mm -hmm. shipping operations, et cetera. But we had to stub out a bunch of things and we, we said, fine, let's just assume we'll buy green coffee from Sweet Maria as you can only get better, like in terms of volume. Um, let's assume certain things and let's just sort of move on. But one of the things we did in the test was um, we um, recruited some friends and family to try out coffees from other roasters. We weren't roasting ourselves. We just bought some bags, rebagged them and started sending them to people. One thing mm -hmm. that we discovered as a, as a, like a really huge insight and honestly still drives our, our business model to this day is that people have a perception of quality based on what they want to be, sound, you know, they want they want to sound like a connoisseur, but in reality, the habits of what they drink is is very real and much more taste based. Um, mm -hmm. So the more specific example of that is like if I give you a quiz to fill out online, you're likely to pick things that sound cool and and unique and interesting. Whereas when you actually taste it, you're gonna be like, oh, I don't really like this coffee. We like we sent coffee to a, an extremely trained chef and mm -hmm. what they liked was completely different from what we expected them to like and what what they even said that they would like so um <laughs> then we sort of a step two of that test was to send small quantities of multiple coffees that tasted different and essentially from that we realized that you know what if we just map to um, we take off, like, we, we don't do any online quiz or screening situation at all. The first thing that you experience from us is actual coffees you taste on your own time. Um, and then based on what you like, we personalize so that we are sending you coffees that you will like that you've tasted mm -hmm. yourself. So as an example, if you end up telling us that you like light roasted Ethiopian coffee, um, that's likely, it's likely that you're gonna like a light roasted Kenyan, Rwanda, Burundi, like more of the similar origins, um, similar sort of taste uh, taste profile. So that's the yeah. personalization that we do. Um, and um, our subscription system has essentially four coffees every four weeks. Uh, it's very dynamic from a operations and roasting standpoint, but it's also, um, 
uh, very interesting for a customer. So it's it's possible that even if you like only one profile of coffee, you're not going to get the same one, but you're going to get something very similar. And so from a personalization mm-hmm. standpoint, you're getting something unique to discover. At the same time, you're not going to get something that is not in your taste profile. So you're going to always enjoy the coffee that you get. Now, we don't get it right 100%, but we get it right more than other people do, for sure. And we, we have lower churn because of that, which is honestly, from a business metric standpoint, that's like the number one thing that drives your subscription. Um, so that's it's right. use people, essentially. It's fascinating. I, I love your, your approach. And uh, I think you've put a lot of thought and a lot of uh, hard work behind all the, the, the framework you're, you're describing. Because it's, it's a lot of those questions I have in my head. And I experience uh, as we, you know, talk to roasters, or visit roasters. Um, I'm, I'm in the coffee industry now for yeah, almost 20 years uh, in different uh, aspects. So I've, I've, I've tasted quite a bit and sometimes it's exciting to taste something just for the sake of it. But as you say, sometimes you, this is not what you want to drink every day. And, that, and the same goes with restaurants. I love to go out. I love to explore. I love to travel, right? I go to mm. other places. And then sometimes when I come back, I feel like, you know, I just want some simple food for a few days, <laughs> just something very, very easy and um, makes me happy, you know, but both makes it makes me happy. Also the, the, the experience of something different because it pushes the boundaries a little bit. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I like what I hear. And I think that's uh, from a, from a consumer perspective, you're very close to, to them, to what they, to what they need and want. Yeah. Um, and not so much pushing your own agenda on what you think the world should look like um, and but at the same time it's 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 both a little bit right you push a little bit but you also give <laughs> exactly yeah and i think it's a i think it it kind of comes down to incremental change you know mm-hmm. if you just try to like shock someone with something that's very new and interesting you know it works for some people but most people yeah. i imagine work with incremental change like it's mm-hmm. taken us mm-hmm. about three years to convince our parents to drink our coffee. Like it's kind Mm -hmm. of embarrassing, honestly, but you know, you want this, you want the change to stick, right? Like Mm -hmm. if you just force it, uh, you know, they they may say that they're they're drinking drift away, but they may not actually drink it. Um, You know, so, but we've slowly, (laughs) you know, through sort of soft um, persuasion and then obviously showing them uh, and upgrading their equipment and whatnot, We've converted them from like instant, uh, from you know eons ago, uh, yeah. brands to like actually using fresh beans. Uh, it takes time. It's it's worth it, but it takes time. Absolutely, I I have the same experience with with my friends and family, and we we did an experiment about fifteen years ago in a factory cafeteria in Colombia. So fifteen years ago, the specialty concept was not that known for Colombians in yeah. country so they they had some some had access but more in the bigger cities and more the you know upper class maybe mm. uh, so we went uh consciously into a factory cafeteria where those those people would love to drink coffee but not know what they're drinking and they wouldn't you know from our perspective maybe not not even care mm. so we took away the coffee they had before we replaced it with specialty coffee and the f- initial reaction was oh my god that coffee is different what's going on Mm-hmm. So they noticed it that something was different. They were not saying, oh, this is good. This is great. No, it was like, oh, this is different. And different was intimidating and not, not that great. But then they got over it because it's like, there's nothing they could, would, would want to do about it. It's coffee's coffee and it's free and it's in the cafeteria. So what, yeah. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> After two months, we switched it back to the old coffee. And that's where we got the reaction of like, Oh my God, this coffee is so bad. What's going on? <laughs> so they noticed it only over time that they actually had the better things in their cup. And that's an experience I, I, I get a lot from, from friends. So, uh, you know, I give them or bring them coffees. And then after a while, it's like, uh, no, but you spoiled me. Now I can't go back. What, yeah. what have you done? <laughs> oh, that's literally my experience too. When I, when I first started drinking coffee, I would do vanilla powder, sugar, chocolate powder, cinnamon, and then creamer. And then I was like, okay, I can't keep doing this. So I started incrementally taking out those things and I worked my way to black coffee. But at the time it was commercial black coffee, like diner coffee kind of stuff. 
And then when I started getting into specialty before I started working, maybe like three, four years ago, I really started really drinking a lot of specialty. And the more specialty coffee I drank, um, every time then I would go for like a, 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 a last minute like coffee that I needed or an emergency coffee at a diner, I couldn't drink it. My palate couldn't handle it. Like I, I literally just would rather just suck it up with no coffee than, than drink it. I just couldn't do it anymore because like my palate got so used to high quality coffee. So that's yeah, that's that's uh, it's interesting. You you have that experience, Norbert. <laughs> this also goes back to the education um, space. Like lots of people mm-hmm. will ask us, especially in the virtual tastings, because it's you know even though you're you're trying to focus on the tasting, the questions are about coffees all all types of questions um anything and everything you know from everything from like asking the educator like what's your favorite coffee have you been to a farm you know all sorts of questions are are fair game but the one that Mm. gets asked the most and and we've taken a little bit of time to like craft a really diplomatic response is um uh is should i drink this coffee black or can i add milk and creamer to it you know it's a very basic question obviously People will do whatever they want to do, but we've taken time to just say something very specific that is like, you know what? I think you should drink it the way you enjoy it, but I would highly recommend trying one sip black, <laughs> only one sip, yeah. no more. In fact, don't even try more than one to begin with. And you know, some people will commit and really enjoy and like slowly start their journey, but you just want to give them that one nudge. And then mm-hmm. see where it goes. Like everybody's going to have their own experience and own journey. I totally agree. I have that's exactly the same. I think many years ago I would be more hardcore, hardcore coffee hipster, and it's like, no, this is black. You cannot like you destroy it if you put anything else in it. <laughs> you you disrespect it, and and you know I've come um, also from that perspective a long way. I think to, as you say, recommend and ease them in. And ultimately, you know, it's their it's their taste experience, it's their coffee experience, and if that coffee experience needs some 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 sugar and some uh, some milk, so so be it. I myself sometimes try <laughs> to put some 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 sugar in, it's like because people do it. I love sugar, I I love sweets, and whenever I do it, I always feel like no, this is all. It's always a mistake. It's like it for me. It just just doesn't go with coffee i don't want that i don't want sugar in there <laughs> um but you know um sometimes i feel especially when i'm traveling and and i you know it's it's some diner coffee it's like oh let's let's see well, that's that's how a lot of people drink it so maybe it maybe it's good and it's not for me but anyway like what you've heard so far this podcast is brought to you by Cropster, a software solution that connects coffee professionals from origin to roasteries and cafes around the world. Whether you produce, trade, roast, or brew coffee, Cropster products will help your business take that next step. So can can we shift it a little bit over to the technology side? Because yeah, uh, yeah. Let's go I it. hear a lot of a lot of data is um, is in play when you talk about your business. So you manage all the uh, the, the quality feedbacks, uh, so the preferences, the taste profiles, uh, of course, all the ordering and the and the logistics aspect of it. Um, what, what what do you can can you tell us a little bit about it? What that means to your to your business, um, and um, I don't know what systems you might use or yeah, how this all came about. Yeah, yeah. Um... So we use um, we use WooCommerce, which is based on WordPress. Um, mm-hmm. Fairly common, uh, often sort of um, chided for not having the best performance, uh, but very flexible. So right. you know, we're basically able to do a lot of things with yeah. minimum or like some amount of um, developer effort. So. Um, that's basically like the engine that, that supports everything. Um, mm-hmm. the, um, on the data side of things, you know, I think what we tend to focus on the most is making sure that, um, you balance, um, the data side of things with a multi-level user experience. 
ultimately, you know, we are B to C, like or D to C mm-hmm. also, in, you know, in more current terms. So customers sometimes want to engage on just a very simple level. They just want to say yes or no, you know, if they like a coffee or not. Sometimes people want to say yes, but this is a 84 out of 100. And I find these notes in it. I find, you know, this is sort of the detailed feedback mm-hmm. for a coffee. So we allow people to do that. Um, and we, we basically use a lot of that data to inform what we're selecting. Um, now it's been enough time that most of our green selection is based on scores and confirmation of existing coffees that we carried in the past. Um, mm-hmm. sometimes logistics come in the way, so we have to like be flexible, uh, especially in this past year, it's been more complicated, but for the most part, we are trying to buy the same coffees year over year, as long as the ratings are high and continue to remain high or they get better, uh, or if they're getting worse also, like how much worse. Um, so we use the, our data to inform that, um, mm-hmm. we use, uh, um, in addition sort of to rating just the coffees from the initial kit. You can rate all the coffees that you get over time. We have some customers that have been around for like six years, seven years since the Mm -hmm. very beginning. And so they've rated about 350 different roasts um, potentially. And so we use that data to like inform what we're gonna send them the next time. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's essentially like a tool that we've built custom in-house that you know, we import all the orders, click a button, and everybody gets a coffee assigned, um, mm-hmm. and with some with some exceptions. Um, so essentially, we use all of the processing um, um, orders and fulfillment component of it is based on ratings and reviews and data that people have. And then I think the the one thing that we we took a trip to um, Costa Rica, Guatemala, sort of a origin trip. Um, honestly, we don't travel much to origin because we have too much coffee to too many different types of coffees to buy. And mm-hmm. even historically, we just felt like it was more of a, you know, marketing ploy to take a bunch of photos. Um, and, mm-hmm. and, uh, <laughs> so, but we did do a couple of trips and, you know, one of them, we, we, you know, we try to like understand from the producers and the farmers, like what, what is it that you want? You know, obviously, there's the transactional money component of it, component of it which um, is right. there. And um, the second thing everybody wanted, um, and nobody asks for this explicitly, but it felt like they just want like more stability. So if you can commit to longer term, then that's something that allows them to stop worrying about the basics and worry about improvements and expansion and things. I mean, that's what you want them to do as well. You don't want you know just we don't want us to grow ourselves. We also want everybody else to grow with us. Um, and the third thing that was very, uh, explicit that they wanted, and, and this is where a lot of the data comes into play is, you know, it's a very simple question, but they, they, everybody asked every single one, we met like five or six different groups of farmers, including some co-ops and stuff. And everybody asks like, what did you think of this coffee? And Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a big, heavy question. Like Mm -hmm. there's so many ways to answer it. And so we, when we finished that trip, we came back, we were like, you know, we really have a lot of information that we're sitting on that we should mm-hmm. share with the farmers. It just sort of closes the feedback loop. Now, whether they're able to do anything with the rod is, is actually a question that we, you know, ask ourselves a lot. Uh, mm-hmm. But at the very minimum, we're just sharing information and hopefully right. that converts to knowledge. So what mm-hmm. we do is we take all the, ratings, reviews. Um, we also have like specific farmer feedback fields that we collect from our customers and subscribers. So as you're mm-hmm. rating coffee, you can choose to send more feedback to the farmers directly. And then we collect that, we report it back to, you know, we send it back to the importers or to the farmers if we're in touch with them directly, basically as far back in the supply chain as we can. Um, initially, we thought that it would be very useful for them to like do crop planning but honestly i i am not a farmer i don't really know how it can be used or it could be used at all at the very minimum we're trying to answer that question like 
what do you think of this coffee? Here's some data points from like thousands of people, not like one person, not like one cupper. Or that's one amazing. Cup. That's that's a, such a unique opportunity you ha you have here. And as you said, it's, I think it's um, maybe initially not fully clear what can you do with that data, um, and and will it become actionable or some exactly like get get to the higher level uh, into the into the knowledge uh, uh, area, but. Uh, it also shows a certain amount of respect and and communication and and uh, like a linkage, uh, which we are, we're trying to establish so hard. Uh, I think there's such a need and it and a, and a desire from consumers to understand where things come from. Yeah. So we see more information about farmers and ex ex let's I would say from a different if you say different to expose the farmer a little bit more towards consumers. So it's also quite um, an honest move to do the same vice versa. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the same The same goes for, for consumers. If you know the farm name and the farmer's face and the altitude, I mean, what, what is the action you take? Maybe mm -hmm. there's, there's no conscious action we can take, right? I, I hear you, Sir. I'm, I'm at, I'm, a, I'm an IT guy by training and you know we work in, we work in databases and we work in tables and we would like to make sense of certain things but sometimes it's just a feeling of being connected yeah and I think that feeling uh, we have for the consumers so they feel connected to their products so that you know there's more loyalty there there's more engagement and the same would go for the farmer if they get to know a little bit their their consumers and uh, feel, you know, it's, it goes a long way and uh, it's, it's hard life on the farm, knowing that your, your product is appreciated, that there's people thinking about it, if it's positive or negative, and that may, I guess it's positive more than negative. Yeah. It, you know, it, 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 it uplifts their, their day. And if that alone happens, it's, it's a wonderful thing. Yeah. I think you can make a huge difference. <laughs> yeah, that's the, that's the intent. I think, I think the other thing that I've noticed is that there is a, a feeling of like us and them are like separate entities that can't necessarily communicate unless you work through the supply chain. And especially with like, mm -hmm. um, smartphones proliferation everywhere in the world, like literally everywhere, um, including like you know, 1900 meter high mountains in coffee growing mm -hmm. countries all over Central, South America, Africa, everywhere. Um, it, literally everyone is connected. So the choice at this point is not whether you can communicate with them, but whether you want to. And mm -hmm. I think one of the barriers that we are trying to break down is like to try to reach the farmers more directly. Now, we don't want to be interruptive, like everybody has work to do and business just to run and <laughs> lots of like lives to live. But from it, it is like the excuse to like, oh, I can't reach them because they are unreachable. That excuse is not valid anymore. And so we're trying to like make sure that we don't hide behind that and at least do the, mm -hmm. do the bits that we can and communicate with them directly. I mean, I have a few people that I contact with on text message, like producers mm -hmm. in Colombia, like you just... It's just like a normal relationship. Like it's like having a friend next door and you just right. say, Hey, what do you think of this coffee? Like, Hey, how's the, you know, what's going on with the harvest? Like, Oh, there's like riots going on in Bogota. So there's this other issue going on. And so everything's going to be delayed easy, right? Like it's just basic communication and it's not that difficult anymore. Literally you can just text someone. Um, yeah. so like those barriers are, are like mentally starting to break down and then re in reality, hopefully will lead to like better communication in two directions not just one direction can you can you see um that as a as a next step for your platform to have your customers chat or interact directly with the farmer yeah yeah we've done um we do this uh maybe not not fully quite yet um mm -hmm. but we've been doing on and off um um instagram live interviews with mm -hmm. um farm managers or um you know in some cases like we buy a decent amount of coffee from caravella um mm -hmm. who run like these qc labs in you know very close to origin um right. so with the you know people that work there and we ask them mm -hmm. about the lots that we're buying and like you know and then obviously it's instagram live so 
you can, as a consumer, join and ask a question, um, stuff like that. I honestly, not that many people engage because I think we haven't nailed the format or the timing or we just don't have the scale quite yet. But mm-hmm. I think it's promising mm-hmm. because it's it's essentially your way to connect with a farmer. You're right. So um, I'm curious. So you obviously, um, your for producers in origin working with someone like you, the, the transparency is there and the access is there to, to that to the data you make available. Um, but I'm curious to know what other opportunities you know there are or ways you know with for producers that work with specifically you know uh, buyers like you, subscription services. You know what other opportunities are there to strengthen the relationships? I mean, is it as simple as just the fact that you having a subscription service, you have a more fixed revenue that can allow you then to make more commitments in buying from producers on a long-term scale. I mean, what is that? What do those opportunities look like? A couple of thoughts come to mind. I'm not sure if I have a, <laughs> like a, a good answer for this, but uh, one thing is um, buying more coffee from the same people, uh, multiple lots, mm-hmm. different uh, everybody has multiple slots to fill as a roaster. Some things are super unique and interesting. Some things are, you know, regional blends or like more of a, more of a, a mix. Um, so that's one of the things that we are working on is to have like different profiles of coffee from the same farm, from the same producers. Um, so just more volume. It's actually common sense in a in a basic way. Like it just makes sense to reduce your risk by working with fewer people but you know that's not the only reason we do it we do it because we want to buy more coffees from the same same uh, same people so that we can support them more um mm. not just the the best fanciest small lots but also like the more common basic lots um <clears throat> i think um on the on the consumer side definitely subscriptions and more specifically like prepaying for a subscription either as a gift or for yourself is a big commitment that you can make to us and therefore we can make to um to uh, producers green you know importers uh, everyone sort of we work with um so we definitely highly highly encourage that on all levels without you know forcing people into it um the um a few years ago, even maybe three, four years ago, we were mostly buying spot, a little bit, a um, little bit like repeat spot, which is kind of a strange, um, strange system, but still kind of works, especially for really large lots. Over the last few years, we've converted to almost buying no spot. Um, mm-hmm. Maybe, you know, if some issues happen. Maybe ten percent or less of our cop fewer of our copies are are spot. Um, so we are just committing more to farmers because we can, and we know how much we're going to need. So we have like a forecasting system in place that um, has already mapped out for the next nine months how much coffee we're going to need. Um, it allows us to be seasonal as well. Like something that lands immediately is transferred into a position, roasted, shipped to customers. So like we're just much more we're, we're able to be more dynamic with it because we know exactly how much we need when we need it and then we're able to use it quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of these promises are filled by like other roasters in different ways. Uh, uh, like I know people like air freight green coffee. Sometimes uh, I think it's questionable whether it's worth it or not. Um, but it's the idea is that to use green quickly, and so we're trying mm-hmm. to do that too. Yeah. No, for sure. Um, and that's really interesting. So uh, it makes me think of another question on the on the techno- technology side. Um, uh, I'm wondering, um, so you have all this data from your consumers that you pass on to, that you can pass on to your producers. As you continue to grow and scale, I'm wondering what some of the like technological challenges that you have faced in the past or may continue to face what those are in terms of being able to support an infrastructure to hold all that data and, you know, create, create something to continue to build on that data. Um, you know, is it just simply being able to finance developers or are there other, other little things that, uh, that make that, um, a difficulty? Yeah. Um, 
So the one challenge that we face that is now in it, in hindsight it's embarrassing, but in in you know in it is very real. Um, every year in uh, the holiday season, we sell a lot of thousands of coffee gifts, uh, which are mm. essentially subscriptions. Um, mm -hmm. So an average one is like a six month monthly subscription. So you know I will give you a, a gift. Uh, that you will then set up and use for the next six months. Um, and then this year it did not happen because we were prepared for it, but at least the, at least a couple of times in the past, in January, the site crashes in the middle of the night because all these people have, um, all the gift receivers have, re have sort of set up their subscriptions. And all of these subscriptions generate orders. It's like just a, it's a basic infrastructure problem. Uh, but it's happened a bunch of times because we don't know what the next level of scale is. Um, mm -hmm. And so uh, I think we've solved it now because, you know, optimization from a performance standpoint is just very, very critical. We have a person on staff that is just like spends most of their time dedicated to doing that. Um, but, you know, um, I think that's, that's like a, uh, that's just a, a challenge that we just actively consider and think about. I think we are um, starting to wonder a little bit. Um, our product offerings and portfolio um, has always been focused on the younger audience in terms of the target audience. Um, so mm. 25, 44, you know, in terms of like a marketing demographic and, um, but we've been ignoring or not addressing an older audience and an even younger audience. So how do we do that? Um, um, by, you know, either expanding the portfolio of products. Um, so that's something that we're thinking about. And this is all based on data in terms of like um, feedback from the, from the customers. Um, another like feedback area from, from a data standpoint is um, churn. Um, so we obviously focus quite a bit on reducing churn, but the number one reason that people cancel, and this is a real problem for every single subscription company, not just in copy, but in, in general, is the number one reason people cancel is cost. Um, mm -hmm. So um, so like, how do we uh, either introduce a secondary layer of coffees that are like less expensive, that will hold people in, for longer so like expanding the product portfolio because at some point you know like the market is growing in terms of our addressable market for for home consumers and especially coffee but to grow it even further or to grow it even faster we need to like mod modify our offerings a little bit so that's something we're considering um especially for next year mm -hmm. cool nice uh well no thanks a lot so uh super interesting what you're doing and uh really uh really exciting to have you on here man appreciate it very very inspiring uh Suyuk. um i loved hearing your story and your your history and i think a very good things uh, will come from it i'm i'm a big believer in da in data in in you know knowing uh, or looking back in having having a history or historical data sets and then from that derive the future um, of course, it also needs creative ideas and and a lot of trials and errors, as you as you know. Uh, but um, it it really it it informs you so much more. So, yeah. and that's I think also one of the reasons we have built Cropster because that was a big need in the coffee industry to have that opportunity to go back and replicate and learn and you know not only from oh, the, the the human experience can change very or the human. Um, thought of the past can change very quickly it's very fragile suddenly you only think about the good things and forget about the bad or as you know you forget certain details uh, which are not unimportant yeah so so having that uh heard from you again like hey this is how you can build a business even if you start small you start on the be more you 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 work very hard uh you take risks you you know it's it's fantastic you always had this methodical approach um and and like let's put a concept down let's think about it let's take the next step so 
I, I, I congratulate you to your success and I wish you much more and, and many more customers and less churn and, <laughs> um, and more connections to, to producers and, and to within the coffee supply chain. That's very inspiring. So, yeah, thank you so thank very you. much. Thanks, Norbert. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Coffee and Technology Podcast brought to you by Cropster. If you enjoyed what you heard, please subscribe or give us a follow on any of our channels to always get the latest episode. If you're interested in more educational content on all things coffee and tech, be sure to head to cropster.com forward slash learn or visit our YouTube channel. Cheers to more coffee.